Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of cardiac physiology, and this is recording part five. We're going to talk now about the cardiac conduction system. I know some of this material is discussed in other courses, but it's worthwhile reviewing in the context of our physiology discussion. The cardiac impulse begins in the SA node, the sinoatrial node, which is located right at the top of the right atrium, where the superior vena cava enters the atrium. These are self-exciting cells that cause regular spontaneous depolarizations, and we call that automaticity. They are the pacemaker cells, and they have a standard rate of about 70 to 80 beats per minute. Once they've generated the impulse, it's conducted across the atria until it reaches the AV, the atrioventricular node which is in the septal wall of the right atrium. The AV node actually can be a pacemaker too. It also has automaticity, but it's at a slower rate of about 40 to 60 beats per minute. So usually it doesn't have to generate any um, beats of its own because it is over, being over, uh, because the uh, SA node beats are overriding it. So the AV node really only controls heart rate when the SA node becomes slower or if something happens to cause the AV node to speed up. As the impulse gets from the SA node across the atria to the AV node, conduction is slightly delayed, and this allows the atria to empty their blood into the ventricles. After the AV node, conduction continues through the bundle of Hiss, which is, the in, which is located in the intraventricular septum, and then the bundle divides into the Purkinje fibers, left and right, and they provide fast conduction to ve both ventricles in order to cause depolarization and contraction. Here's a diagram of what we've just discussed. The SA node located in the right atrium. It sends its impulses through the atria until we get to the AV node right over here. The AV node then sends impulses down the bundle of Hiss and into the Purkinje system the right and left Purkinje fibers. There are parasympathetic fibers which innervate the atria and the conducting tissues, and when they are activated, they decrease heart rate. Acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter, and it acts on muscarinic receptors in the heart to produce negative chronotropy, that is, a slower heart rate, negative dromotropy, which is it decreases conduction, so it slows conduction, and negative inotropy, it decreases the contractile force. The vagus nerve is the main fiber that transmits parasympathetic signals. And there's baseline vagal tone, so your body always has some vagal input into the heart, and then your body can choose to increase that tone or take it away depending on the uh, clinical situation. The heart also has sympathetic fibers. They originate from the T1 to T4 nerve roots of the spine. They're distributed throughout the heart, and they act mostly on the beta-1 adrenergic receptors, and they have positive chronotropic, dromotropic, and inotropic actions. So you can see there are multiple ways that the heart can change the way it conducts electrical signals, depending on the clinical need. A quick review of the normal electrocardiogram. We start with the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization. As the impulse moves through the atrium from the SA node to the AV node, we see the P wave. The repolarization of the atrium won't be seen because it will be hidden under the QRS complex. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization as the impulse moves through the his purkinje system. The T wave is then ventricular repolarization. The PR interval is normally 0.12 to 0.2 milliseconds, or 3 to 5 small boxes. This measures the period from the start of atrial excitation until the start of ventricular excitation. The QT interval is the duration of ventricular contraction. Often we look at the corrected, or the QTC, 
This estimates the QT interval at 60 beats per minute, and there are many different formulas that can be used. One I've given here is the QT divided by the square root of the RR interval. But there are many calculators online that can calculate the QTC for you. A normal QTC is less than 440 in men, or 460 milliseconds in women. And a good rule of thumb is that the QTC should be less than half of the preceding RR interval. Just a reminder, the EKG only records a potential when current is flowing from one part of the heart to another part. So the muscle has to be partly polarized and partly depolarized. In general, we know that current moves in the heart from the base or from the atria down towards the apex or the ventricles. So in general, impulses are moving from the head towards the foot, from the right side to the left side, and from the patient's back towards their front. Maximum positive deflection on the EKG will be seen when the electrical impulse is moving along the axis of the lead being measured. And since each lead has a different axis, we may see positive or negative deflections during different parts of the cardiac cycle. This schematic just shows a random lead moving from this direction to that direction. So any current moving in this direction would show up as a positive deflection on this meter and a positive deflection on this EKG chart. Once the wave has passed and the entire muscle is depolarized, we see that the depolarization wave returns down to baseline. Now we have repolarization. Again, we have current moving in the same direction, but really it's moving in the opposite direction because you can see now that the charges are shifted. And as a result, this looks like a negative deflection. And this is the repolarization of the cardiac cells back towards their baseline state. And once again, once the repolarization is finished, the entire muscle is at the same polarization and the wave returns back to baseline. First of all, here's that EKG, P wave for atrial contraction, QRS, ventricular depolarization, T wave, ventricular repolarization. There are three different kinds of leads in a 12 lead EKG. There are the bipolar leads called one, two, and three. They're really just three different combinations of two leads, each on different sides of the heart. And they're all similar because they're all pretty much parallel to the flow of current in the heart. Let's see a picture. Here's the right arm, the left arm, and the left leg. And so there's lead one, there's lead two, and there's lead three, all moving right to left, two of them moving head to foot. We have the unipolar or the augmented leads called AVR, AVF, and AVL. And they're different combinations of one lead referenced against the other two leads. The one that's out is the AVR. It's a little bit inverted because it points in the opposite direction of flow in the heart. So these leads would be AVL, again, going right to left. AVF, again, going down. And then AVR, which is really going up and towards the right. That's a little bit backwards from all the others. So a lot of things that would be positive in the other leads may be negative in the AVR lead. Which of these leads do we normally see in the operating room? It's usually one of the bipolar leads, usually lead one or lead two. You can see lead two is sort of the best because it really shows the axis of movement from right to left and up to down. We also have the precordial leads or the chest leads. They're called V1 through V6. Here you can see how they're placed on the chest. And if we look at a transverse section through the chest, you can see conduction goes this way. So V1 is really more anterior and septal. V3, 4 are more anterior. And V5, 6 are more lateral. The QRS complexes become more positive as you move from V1 to V6. Again, because that's the direction of current moving. And we call this R wave progression. So here you can see the R wave is relatively negative because V1 has an axis this way and the, trans, uh, the transmission of electric current is really that way.
as we get more towards anterior and lateral, the QRS complexes become more positive, and we call this R wave progression, starting negative and becoming more and more positive. Patients who have impaired R wave progression may have ischemic heart disease. I like this picture because it shows how a normal 12 lead EKG provides a little bit of a map of the heart. So this takes everything that we've just discussed and puts it into one picture. And so when we see abnormalities in one or more of these leads, we can start to map that abnormality towards different parts of the heart. That's it for our basic discussion of EKG. In the next section, we'll talk about EKG abnormalities. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you in the next recording.